The second album from the band Omen. No, not the Australian Omen, or the Hungarian Omen, or the Malaysian Omen, and certainly not the UK Omen, but the American band's second album builds well upon their debut release and generally improves upon their power metal sound. Omen is among a number of bands considered to have started the American power metal genre in the 1980s, including such other bands as Manowar, Sabotage, and Manila Road, who were, in turn, influenced by power metal progenitors Rainbow, Judas Priest, and Iron Maiden. Speaking of whom, there's the incredibly obvious and very strong Iron Maiden influence on Warning of Danger. But it's filtered through Omen's own brand of melodic power metal, and it really works for them. Certainly not a clone band. In all fairness, though, the production is a little flat, but some strong tracks make up for a whole lot of that. With Side 2 as the stronger half of the album, my recommended tracks include Termination and especially Red Horizon. I discovered Omen on their appearance on the 12 Commandments in Metal compilation album released by Roadrunner Records, specifically the track Torture Me. If looking for reissues, there is a notable vinyl one for this album that came out in 2017 from their original label Metal Blade Records. Available on transparent blue vinyl, the release was limited to 500 copies and includes a lyric insert and poster. A lot of comparisons get made between Warning of Danger and Omen's first album Battle Cry. And not without reason. The two are similar in some respects, but with the latter being a bit more melodic and catchier at times. If this is your initial exposure to the band, the first two albums are an excellent introduction to Omen. And Omen are still around, with founder and guitarist Kenny Powell as the only remaining original member. Sadly, their classic vocalist J.D. Kimball died of cancer in 2003, but he is well represented on their first four releases and a memorable singer in the history of American power metal. Omen's most recent releases include a full-length studio LP in 2016 and a CD single in 2018. The second album from Los Angeles speed metal band Agent Steel had all the makings, as well as the connections, to become a bigger band than they were. They were even courted by a major label. But it wasn't to be. In contrast to their debut album, Unstoppable Force had a tighter performance and better production, as well as even more influence from Queensryche. It's hard not to make the comparison here, notably in John Cyrus' vocals, but also in some of the U.S. power metal leanings reminiscent of The Warning and even occasionally Rage for Order. And although Cyrus might not consistently measure up to classic-era Jeff Tate, he does deliver an impressive performance with some unique vocal touches that are signature Agent Steel. The fact that I've compared a number of singers to Cyrus in the past should tell you that he has his own thing going on in the vocal department. As is fairly evident on the record, Agent Steel has a lyrical interest in UFOs, aliens, and the like. Voivod and Nocturnus aside, you weren't finding too many metal bands in the 1980s delving that deeply into such subjects. Though now, there are plenty of sci-fi metal bands, such as Blood Incantation and Vector, to name a couple of the more notable acts. Recommended tracks include Rager, Never Surrender, and the title track to Unstoppable Force. You can't stop it. As for obstacles, one rather strange one came from their actual label. For reasons unclear, Combat suspended Agent Steel's contract, which meant that they couldn't record anything during that seven-year period, nor could they record with another label, in effect freezing the band until 1993. As a result, Agent Steel disbanded. So if you've wondered why they didn't put out material until late in the 90s, that's likely the big reason. The most recent vinyl reissue of Unstoppable Force was the 2016 High Roller Records version, released in black, 150 copies, as well as clear and yellow splatter, 350 copies. After a few breakups and makeups, Agent Steel once again reformed in 2019 with Cyrus as the only original member. Their latest album, the first in 14 years, is entitled No Other Gods Before Me and was released in April of 2021. 
Agent Steele was certainly part of a metal scene in 1980s Los Angeles that was wholly separate from the glam metal bands for which the town is much better known. Alongside such bands as Slayer, Megadeth, Abattoir, and Armored Saint, Agent Steel represented a more traditional metal sound with the same speed and aggression of their contemporaries, but just didn't seem to get the same break. Regardless, Unstoppable Force is a speed metal classic, and I would recommend both it, as well as their debut record, Skeptic's Apocalypse, which is a bit thrashier and more raw. The power metal juggernaut, known as Manowar, began their conquest of the world with a marginally produced album, but with some epic tracks. And while much has been said about most of their discography, it's their second album that sometimes gets sadly overlooked. Into Glory Ride marks the band's exit from Liberty Records and onto the much more prominent label known as Megaforce. The members of Manowar apparently felt it was an auspicious occasion, and perhaps besting Kiss on this one, signed their record contract in their own blood, as covered in the August 1983 issue of Kerrang! magazine. The album was produced by John Mathias, who would later produce records for Mass, Banshee, and The Great Cat. As for Man of War, the production of Into Glory Ride is an improvement on battle hymns, but it seems having the level of production deserving of their music really wouldn't come until Fighting the World, when they'd finally get signed to a major label. And for those of you looking for secret messages etched in the runout of this record, you'll be happy to find Death to False Metal on the A side and Into Glory Ride on the B side. Hard choices here for favorites, as much of the tracks run par with each other. But if I have to choose, it's Gloves of Metal and Secret of Steel. You were called by the gods that powers to wield. God, well, the secret of steel. Oh, A month after the release of Into Glory Ride is when Manowar put out their well-coveted single for the song Defender. Released by Music for Nations, this is the original version of the song, which didn't appear on Into Glory Ride, but the song would later resurface in a newly recorded version on the 1987 release of Fighting the World. The two versions are noticeably different, and if you have a preference for one over the other, let me know in the comments. If you're familiar with the album version of the song, then you might already know that famed actor Orson Welles did the narration for it. And he's also on the single version, though it's an entirely different take recorded from a different session with Welles. As far as promotion for the record, there is a music video for the track Gloves of Metal, a video I actually never knew existed until the age of YouTube when I shared it with equally amazed friends who also never knew about it. Seems getting the word out about Man Award back then wasn't easy. So the big mystery of this album, and something my research didn't solve, is in the dedication. Who exactly is John Robert Curry? If you know, let us all know in the comments below. Although there hasn't been an official vinyl reissue of this album yet, there was the Imperial Edition in 2019 by Magic Circle Entertainment on CD and digital download, and with all new cover artwork. Perhaps one day, Manowar will see fit to put out this album on the format, as they already had with most of their classic output. While perhaps not appreciated in the same way as Hail to England or The Triumph of Steel, Inter Glory Ride still has plenty of metal goodness to offer that really shines at its slow driving guitars and pummeling drums. And you know, maybe Eric can sing a little too. Incidentally, my favorite Manowar album. The fourth full-length album from Florida's Sabotage followed a somewhat failed commercial record, a direction pushed on the band by their label, Atlantic Records. So at this point, the question became, could Sabotage make a successful album with mainstream appeal, but still remain true to their own creative vision? A whole lot of signs point to yes. Hall of the Mountain King is a clear reference to composer Edvard Grieg's In the Hall of the Mountain King, whose relevance is most evident in the track Prelude to Madness, which is an arrangement of Grieg's signature piece. Classical fans will also note the track's introduction, as it's a brief rendition of the Gustav Holst's piece Mars, the Bringer of War. The album was produced by Paul O'Neill, who was influential in Sabotage's musical direction change here, including their addition of symphonic elements, as well as the beginnings of their future progressive metal leanings. Apparently, Sabotage was satisfied with O'Neill's work, as he worked with the band on the following nine albums as well. 
O'Neill also produced albums for Omen, Metal Church, and Trans-Siberian Orchestra, among others. Sadly, Paul O'Neill died in 2017. Preferred tracks on this album include the title track, and especially White Witch. Another track worth checking out on the album is Strange Wings, featuring guest co-vocalist Ray Gillen of Badlands and Black Sabbath. Gillen is definitely an underrated singer and never really got the credit he's due. Check out this and some of his other performances with the bands I'd mentioned to hear what I'm saying. The album did pretty well for itself. It's considered one of their more popular releases, also having reached number 116 on the Billboard 200 chart in early 1988. Two music videos from songs in this record were also released for the tracks Hall of the Mountain King and 24 Hours Ago. As for reissues on vinyl, there was a 2004 release of the album on picture disc by Vinyl Maniacs out of Sweden, with only 1,000 made. Expect to pay about $60 and up for this one, in good shape, as of the time of this recording. At this point in their career, Sabotage was really trying to get back to their metal roots. After bending to the will of their record label and recording the previous album, Fight for the Rock. Elements of power and prog metal, combined with some classical sensibilities, really came together on Hall of the Mountain King and set the stage for their next album, which is another fan favorite known as Gutter Ballet. I'd recommend both Hall and Gutter, as well as their debut album, Sirens, to start with. Fantastic stuff. The video you just watched was a compilation of clips from the Vinyl Reacquisition Project, a program available on the Accusation Network YouTube channel. Make sure to check out all of my shows on the subjects of metal vinyl collecting, as well as classic and modern metal bands in general. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out the full episodes of the show. And of course, like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching.